In this video, I'm going to talk about the Schrodinger equation and how with a few simple assumptions we can get it out of the classical conservation of energy. Now, I want to make it absolutely clear that this isn't a mathematical proof of the Schrodinger equation. It isn't the square root of pi or something ridiculous like that. This is just a sort of mathematical justification that the Schrodinger equation does agree with some parts of classical mechanics. And something like the Schrodinger equation would be a very good candidate to describe nature at the atomic scale. Ultimately, though, we decide whether the Schrodinger equation is true or not based on how well it agrees with experiment. And in nearly a century of experimentation, there hasn't been one case where the Schrodinger equation hasn't agreed with experiments extremely well, given that what we're dealing with is very small, roughly the size of atoms, and it's not moving too fast. That is, it's moving way, way slower than the speed of light. With that out of the way, I'll talk about the mathematics that we'll be doing. Now, the equation I'll write down is only really valid in one dimension, but going to three is really as, just as easy as changing the scalars here into vectors. But doing that will just complicate things more than they need to be complicated at this point, and it won't actually add to any of our understanding for the physics happening underneath. So, without further ado, let's write down the Schrodinger equation. So, in the form that we'll be using it, that's I h bar d psi over dt equals minus h bar squared over 2m d squared psi over dx squared plus v psi. Now each of these terms has a special meaning, but the terms with psi in them have something to do with a thing called the wave function. Now the problem with that is that you can't actually understand what the wave function is until you know what the Schrodinger equation means. So I'll just say the least amount I can about the wave function, and that is that it's something to do with the particle's location, and it's a function of space and time. That's vague enough that you don't actually need to unlearn it later on. It is true as far as it goes. So, with that in mind, we'll just ignore the terms with sign them for now and focus on the rest. Now, the i over here is the unit imaginary number. That is i equals the square root of minus 1. The h bars here and here are two, uh, well, they're the same constant. And the way I like to think about it is the constant that tells us how small small really is, in the same way that the speed of light tells us how fast fast really is. Now, the m over here is the mass of the particle that we're dealing with, and the v over here is the potential that the particle it finds itself in. Now, a word about the imaginary numbers. Most people, the first time they come against the Schrodinger equation, are a bit weirded out by the fact that there's an i there. And in this video, I actually show that you don't need the i there, but it does mean that the equation is much more manageable, looks neater, and the mathematics is just, well, prettier, for lack of a better word. Now, that's as much as we can say about the Schrodinger equation right now. We'll go to classical physics for a bit, and remembering that the total energy of a particle, E, that's not subject to a friction force, is equal to its kinetic energy, T, plus the potential energy it has, V. And the kinetic energy, T, is obviously a half mv squared. And V is actually a function of space and time, so that's V is a function of space and time, and it's always equal to some real constant. Call it, uh, c. Now, since we're dealing with classical mechanics, we can obviously remember what the momentum is, and that's p equals mv. Now, we can actually rewrite the kinetic energy in terms of momentum. While this might not make sense right now, it will make the mathematics that comes later on much easier. And it's something that you nearly always do in quantum mechanics. So the kinetic energy just equals p squared over 2m. Since p squared is m squared over v squared, we get the half here, and the m cancels with the m squared here. So that's all the classical mechanics we need for right now. Now we'll bring in two results that don't make sense in classical physics. They're known as the de Broglie wave relations, and they tell us that the momentum p of a particle is equal h bar times k, where k is a wave number, and that its energy E equals h bar omega, where omega is the angular frequency. Now, talking about a frequency and a wave number for a classical particle makes absolutely no sense, so they're, since they're just points. But in quantum mechanics, every particle has associated with it a wave number and a, an, a, an angular frequency, and similarly, every wave has an energy and a momentum. 
And this is as much as we really need to change the classical equation of conservation of energy into the Schrodinger equation. Now the rest of the video, and probably the next one as well, we'll just deal with that. Looking back over here, and looking at the momentum over here, these two are actually exactly the same, and so are these ones over here with energy. So that means that we can actually rewrite the this classical energy conservation in terms of wave variables as h bar omega equals h bar squared k squared, which is the momentum squared, over 2m plus v. Well, this won't make sense right now. We can apply multiply the above equation by a constant, and the equality will still hold. That is, if we multiply by a c, h bar omega will still equal c h bar squared k squared over 2m plus c v. Now, the reason why we actually do that is so we can multiply both sides by the wave function. And even though we don't know what the wave function is, we can be reasonably sure that the wave function at any given point in space and time will be equal to some constant c. Now, this constant will actually turn out to be a complex variable. And since this is true for any particular point, it's true for every point, so we'll just drop the thing in the brackets and talk about psi in general. So we can just multiply psi by h bar omega, and that will still equal psi times h bar squared over k squared over 2m plus psi v. Now this is already starting to look a bit like the Schrodinger equation over here, especially the last term over here exact is exactly the same as this term over here. The other ones still look very different, since there's derivatives over here, and there's just the function by itself over here. To get over this problem, we actually need to start thinking a lot harder about what psi is. Now, since it obviously has some properties of waves, like a wave number and an angular frequency, the easiest form we can suppose it takes is that of a simple harmonic wave. From mathematics, we know that the two simple harmonic waves, sine and cos, are actually linearly independent. That means that even though you can get every other wave as a combination of them, you can't get either one of them as a simple combination of the other one. So we'll suppose that, for now, that there's at least two types of psi, once for sine and one for cosine. So let's call psi one the cosine one. So that's kx minus omega t, and psi two will be the one with sine, which equals sine kx minus omega t. Now, looking at the Schrodinger equation over here, we see that there's a derivative with respect to time and one with respect to space. So we'll differentiate psi1 and psi2 with respect to space and time and see how they behave. d psi1 over dt, that equals minus omega. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. The things in the brackets stay the same. Now, if we look at this, we notice that it's actually the same as this the thing inside the bracket is this. So the derivative of psi1 with respect to time is just omega multiplied by psi2. Now, for psi2 we do the same thing, and we end up with minus omega multiplied by cosine kx minus omega t. And again, we notice that this is just minus omega multiplied by psi1. Similarly, when we differentiate with respect to space, we get d squared psi, 1 over dx squared equals, we get a minus k squared times cosine k x minus omega t, which just equals to minus k squared psi 1. And for psi 2, we differentiate with space, we differentiate twice with respect to space again, and we get minus k squared sine kx minus omega t, which just equals to minus k squared psi 2. We actually see that the derivatives with space and time can be written as multiples of the wave functions. Now, I'm nearly out of time for this video, so I'll continue in the next one where we actually use this. So, I'll see you in the next video.